Hey, squirrel listeners, I am so sorry I've been missing. Been so tired. And I'm always trying to get to this earlier in the morning, and then I'm tired then too, so i just been tired. We'll see how long I last tonight. Maybe not long. This is by Louisa Baldwin. It's called The Uncanny Bairn. As the Scottish would say. Although I'm sure they wouldn't pronounce it the way I do. It's a, a baby or child a bairn is. And it says, uh, The Uncanny Bairn, A Story of the Second Sight. By Louisa Baldwin. And it says, The Uncanny Bairn was included in Baldwin's 1895 anthology, The Shadow on the Blind and Other Ghost Stories. The word bairn is used in parts of Scotland and Northern England to refer to a child. The Uncanny Bairn is the story of a sickly child who grows stronger as he ages and develops some uncanny abilities. The text contains many words that are regional and or no longer used in modern day English, so in some cases links are provided for any reader who requires an expl explanation of what the various words mean. Thank goodness. And it has the pronunciation too. I'm sure I'll run into some that they won't have done that for, but we'll do the best we can. Here's a little bit about the author, about Louisa Baldwin. It says, uh, sometimes credited as Mrs. Alfred Baldwin, Louisa Baldwin was an English novelist, poet, and writer of short stories. She was uh, one of the McDonald sisters, the aunt of the author, Rudyard Kipling. I didn't know that. And the mother of the prime British Prime Minister, Stanley Baldwin. The MacDonald sisters were four Scottish women who became famous for the fact that all four of them married well-known men. Louisa's husband, Alfred Baldwin, was a businessman and a member of Parliament for the Conservative Party. Sorry, I don't know what this thing's doing. Um, Louisa and Alfred's son, Stanley Baldwin, was elected British Prime Minister three times. He holds the distinction of being the only British Prime Minister to serve under three monarch monarchs, George V, Edward VIII, and George VI. After the birth of her son, Louisa Baldwin became plagued by bad health and spent much of her time in a bath chair due to the fact that she always seemed to recover her strength while on holiday. It has been speculated that Louisa Baldwin may have been a hypochondriac. <laughs> Louisa Baldwin died on the 16th of May 1925. To this day, her work is often included in ghost story anthologies. And then we go on to the story again called The Uncanny Bairn, B-A-I-R-N, colon, A Story of the Second Sight by Louisa Baldwin. David Galbraith owned a compact estate in East Lothian, which he farmed at a considerable profit. The land had passed from father to son for a couple of hundred years. It had always yielded a good livelihood to the owner, but never had it been so highly cultivated or produced such abundant crops as under David Galbraith's liberal and skillful management. The oats and potatoes grown on his farm commanded the highest prices in the market, and his root crops were superior to any in the district. The large, solidly built stone house in which so many generations of Galbraiths had lived and died stood in the midst of the property sheltered by a belt of trees 
on rising ground from the sweeping east wind, and the laborers' cottages, equally well constructed to resist the gales that blew across the Firth of Forth. I've been there before. The Firth of Forth in Scotland. Uh, were models of decent comfort. The livestock on the farm was well fed and cared for, and the whole property bore evidence to the wealth, thrift, and intelligence of its owner. And David Galbraith's wife was well-to-do and thrifty like himself. She, too, was the child of a lowland, lowland landowner and farmer and had brought her husband no inconsiderable, here's one of these words, Hang on. It's spelled, <clears throat> spelled T-O-C-H-E-R, but pronounced like Come on. Oh, why aren't you? There we go. Trying to have it. <laughs> Say it again. Tokla. Tokla. I can't even say it. It doesn't sound anything like it looks. It means a dowry. From Scottish Gaelic. To a, a dowry, marriage settlement given to the groom by the bride or her family. Y'all know what a dowry is. While her industry brought her husband no inconsiderable dowry, while her industry and housewifely accomplishments might in themselves has, had, have served as a marriage portion, she too, like her husband, came of a deuce Presbyterian Scot, worthy, upright, upright folk, holding by the faith and practice of their forebears, orthodox and thrifty, worshipping as their fathers had done, and holding the gear, H-A-U-D-I-N-G's, holding, the gear as tightly, nothing doubting, but that to them was especially assigned not only the good things of this world, but also of that which is to come. Galbraith did not marry till he was a middle-aged man. <clears throat> Sorry, went past where I'm... Okay, middle-aged man, but he had long had the cares of a family on his shoulders without its pleasures to lighten the burden. He was the eldest of six orphan sisters and brothers to whom he had acted the part of a father and it was not till Colin the last and youngest had left Scotland for a sheep run in Australia with money lent him by his brother that he felt himself at liberty to marry but now that his pious duty towards his family was fulfilled David Galbraith did not know oh low on storage but now his pious duty towards his family was fulfilled David did not hesitate to take to himself a wife in the person of Miss Allison Mc, McGillivray a lady of some five and thirty years of age and how old did it say he was so what's that she's 35 Away. 
Uh-huh. Is that old you are? It just says middle-aged man. Okay. So, 50-ish. And she was, what I say, 35? Just hit it. Uh, yeah. Five and 30 years of age. With large hands and feet, small gray eyes, high cheekbones, and a complexion betokening exposure to a harsh climate. She was well-educated and intelligent, and talking with her servants and poor neighbors commonly fell into the comfort into the comfortable lowland scotch that her father and mother had taken a pride in speaking only one child was born to david and his wife in the in the ample home where there was space maintenance and welcome for a dozen yet this one was a son and the galbraiths were not doomed to die out the boy was christened Alexander after his two grandfathers, both of whom were Alexanders, so that there was no chance of dispute as to which side of the house should have the naming of the child. And a poor wee frail child he was, apparently inheriting nothing of the strength and vigor of the Galbraiths and McGillivray and McGillivray McGilliveries, nor did he resemble father or mother in feature. He seemed a little foreigner that had come to stay with them for a while, and often in his feeble infancy he bade mm, he bade fair to depart and leave his parents childless, the shrewd bracing winds that were life and health to them, nipped and shriveled him, he took every ailment that was to be had. And when there was nothing catching in the neighborhood, he would originate some illness, illness of his own. Severe, <clears throat> severe enough to have shaken the constitution of any but a seasoned weakling like himself, the lowland farmer would hang over the cradle of his waxen-faced baby, baby, holding his breath for very fear as he looked at the puny thing and would say, dropping into broad scotch as his wont was when strongly moved, why, why would kin this for a barn of mine? Say strong and bonny, and we'll sit up as the Galbraiths have, have I been? Have I been? Away. But the babe won through the troubles and perils of his sickly infancy, and at six years of age had grown into a delicate slip of a child. Mm. with an interesting pair of gray eyes in his pale face and a bright spark of intellect in his big head. <laughs> the family doctor to whose unceasing care Sandy owed his life almost as much as to his mother's devoted nursing forbade his parents to attempt anything in the way of systematic education till the boy was eight or nine years of age. Can ye be content canna ye be content to let will alone he would say and bide till the barn strong strang and healthy before you trouble him to read and write gin ye said his brains a bleeze a bleeze yeah with letters and figures you'll just be burning you'll just be burning down the house that's meant to be the Habitation, <clears throat> excuse me, habitation of a fine soul. <clears throat> Gin you wad hold your ha hands aft, aft it and leave it alone. Maybe I can get this. And little Sandy did very well, though unable to read or write till long after the age at which the children of his father's laborers could spell out a psalm and sign their names 
in a big round hand, but the child had a memory such as must have been commoner in the world before there were uh, before there were books to refer to him refer to <clears throat> I'm so sorry. Refer to at every turn than it is now, and his mind was stored with fairy tales and old border ballads that his mother and nurse told or sung to him in the winter evenings. But Mrs. Gilbraith and Effie were careful never to tell him stories of a weird or ghostly nature, for the doctor had... <coughs> had impressed upon them before all things that Sandy <clears throat> that Sandy must never be frightened. For again the bairn be frightened he will nay sleep, said the astute mistress to the maid, and you'll just hate to sit the lang murk evenings by his bed while you hear the maids daffin by candlelick below or walking with their laddies, but gin ye never let him hear a gaze in wraths. He'll just sleep like a bird with its head under its wing and <clears throat> head under its wing. And whiles and whiles you'll be able to leave him and hay a crack with your neighbors like only either body. Ani either body. Though mother and nurse, actuated by different but equally strong motives, kept all knowledge of the supernatural from the child, there came a day when his father, uh, when his father accused them both of poisoning his mind with stories of witches, warlocks, and ghosts, and making an uncanny bairn of the boy. When Sandy was seven years old of age, a lean and overgrown child without his front teeth and any comeliness he might possess existed only in his mother's eyes. A strange circumstance happened that greatly perplexed and distressed his parents. One cold afternoon late in October, Mrs. Gilbraith told Effie to take a pudding and a can of broth to an old and very poor woman called Elspeth McPhee, who lived at a long cottage a mile from the farm. And Sandy was to go with her for the sake of the walk. The trees were already stripped by the autumn gales to which a dead calm succeeded, and a cold fog had crept up from the sea <clears throat> the sea and brooded over the bare fields, set, settling on the naked boughs in chilly drops, drops of moisture. The careful mother wrapped a plaid round the boy and bade him run as he went to keep himself warm. Away he went to keep himself warm. Away sped Sandy along the high road, driving a ball before him, and see, driving a ball before him, and running after it to send it flying again with a dexterous blow of his stick, till his pale cheeks glowed with the exercise, and the over. And he overshot his mark, ran past old Elspeth's cottage, and had to be recalled by Effie. Ye maun, ye maun put the, M -A -U -N, pit the basket in her hand, and you're in and sell, she said, as she led the reluctant child into the dark, cl into the dark close room where the old woman sat shivering by the fire. Mm, by the fire. Wait a minute. The old woman says, shivering by the fire, spreading her skinny hands over the dying embers. But Sandy held back 
and neither threatening nor coaxing would introduce him uh, into <laughs> I'm so sleepy. Induce him to move a step nearer to Elspeth so that stigmatizing him as a dour limb, Effie was obliged to set the basket on the table herself. It's just a pudding and a few broth that Mr. Skelbraith has sent ye. Let's see. Okay, for she's a mindful of the pure, pure, I guess, she said, as she set out the can and bowl before the old woman. Elspeth looked with a bitter smile. Mm. At the good things spread before her. I'm going to have to stop y'all. I know that wasn't much at all. Well, 20-ish minutes. I'm so sorry. I'll go. Hopefully, if I can... Get my hind end to bed at a decent hour and wake up at a decent... <laughs> I got to get up. Tomorrow morning is, I don't know though, is Krista going to, yeah, Krista's secret yarnery should be out, I know Krista, Chris, Christy wasn't on this past Sunday, that's what I was thinking of, I guess. Love y'all, be sweet, don't be ugly, sneak peek. Love y'all. Bye-bye.